One of the things I get recommended the most on this channel is the Dell Wise series of thin clients. And this makes sense. They're low powered, relatively affordable, and there are tons of them. So today I have not one, not two, but three different Dell Wise systems that I'm going to crack open, test, and mess around with. So let's find out if getting one of these is really that wise of a decision. I had to do it. Now, one thing that is a wise decision is having a high quality USB dock. And there's nothing better than something from the Revo Dock Pro lineup from today's sponsor, Ugreen. Whether you're a content creator, gamer, or other professional, the Revo Dock is designed to meet all of your content needs and streamline your setup. With options like the Revo Dock Pro 210 10-in-1 or 313 13-in-1, you'll never run out of ports. The Revo Dock Pro 210 comes with dual HDMI ports, which support 4K60, and it even has one that supports 8K30. The 313 goes even further, having dual HDMI ports, but also a display port. This lets you have up to three external monitors running simultaneously. With a powerful 100 watt input and 85 watts of pass through via the USB-C power delivery port, you can charge your laptop while connecting all your peripherals with just one cable. Both come with gigabit ethernet as well as a variety of USB ports. The 313 is seriously packed in this regard, with two 5 gigabit ports, two 10 gigabit type A ports, and a 10 gig USB-C port. So I don't think you'll have any issues figuring out how to plug in all your devices. As a content creator, I love the inclusion of independent SD card and TF card readers. If you're looking for a high quality USB dock to simplify your setup, make sure to check the links down in the description below to pick up your Revo dock from Ugreen today. So what are these systems? <laughs> these thin clients are designed for virtual desktop infrastructure or VDI. Essentially the idea is you have a virtual machine or virtual machines running on servers, and then you have these lightweight thin clients that all they do is remote in and stream that desktop back to a workstation essentially. These are really common in corporate environments, and that's why you see a ton of these older models on eBay. While these systems were designed as thin clients for VDI, it's not uncommon to see tinkerers or home labbers using them for projects or to run lightweight servers. And there's a wide variety, clearly, of different form factors and specs, which is why I decided to actually include three of these in today's video. Now I have to give a quick shout out to Tom, who graciously sent over two of these systems, and then also a shout out to one of my patrons, Squiggly? Squirmy? What's his name? One of my patrons, Scrungy, for recommending me to get this little Dell 3040. I think all three of these are fairly unique and should hopefully give a decent overview of what you might expect if you pick up a Dell Wise system. The first system we have today is the 7010, or model number ZX0. And this gets a little bit tricky because these Dell Wise systems have a more consumer facing model number like the 7010 or 5060, but have different model numbers on the actual tags. And so if you're trying to like Google specs and stuff, it can get a little bit tricky, which is why I'm mentioning both. The 7010 features an AMD G T56N processor with two cores clocked at 1.6 gigahertz. It has two gigs of DDR3 memory, as well as an eight gigabyte SATA flash module. And yes, only eight gigabytes of storage. These really are thin clients. The external IO is nothing crazy with a display port, some USB 3 ports, as well as gigabit ethernet. And that's pretty much the story with all of these systems. Next is the 5060 or model number N07D. This features the AMD GX424CC, a four core processor clocked at 2.4 gigahertz. This has four gigabytes of DDR3, as well as another eight gigabyte SATA flash module. Last is the teeny tiny 3040 or model number N10D. This features an Intel Atom CPU, the X5Z8350, which has four cores with a base clock of 1.44 gigahertz. This is by far the most modern CPU being released in 2016, so I'm somewhat hopeful this might have decent performance and low power draw. The system comes with two gigabytes of RAM, as well as eight gigabytes of storage once again, but this time it's not a SATA module, it's soldered directly to the motherboard. I started things off by just turning these systems on to A, just make sure they work, but B, see what operating system they came with. I started first with the 3040, which booted into ThinOS. This operating system comes from Dell, I believe, and is essentially the thin client software that's used to remote into a virtual machine. I really don't know a ton about ThinOS or Thin Linux or Citrix or any of the VDI stuff, so I'm not gonna dig too far into that. Now, one really cool thing I noticed here was while just sitting idle in the operating system, the system was drawing only three watts from the wall, which is pretty impressive and gave me hope that these systems might be a pretty good value. Next was the 5060, which booted into Thin Linux, which I believe is similar to ThinOS, but it's based off of Linux instead of FreeBSD. 
the system wasn't quite as exciting as it idled at 7 was. Now unfortunately when accessing the BIOS I was met with an admin password, but after googling just a little bit I found that pretty much all of these Dell Y systems come with an admin password by default that's just the word Fireport with a capital F. Once I got that plugged in I had access to the BIOS and all was well. Last was the 7010, which booted into an older version I believe of ThinOS, and unfortunately idled at 11 watts. I at least knew that all of the systems worked though, so I decided to crack them open and see what kind of hardware we're dealing with. I started with the 3040, but that was pretty much a big old nothing burger. It's just a small single board computer with essentially no expandability. There was an M.2 E key slot for a Wi-Fi card, but I had a feeling with it being a newer Intel platform, it was going to be CNVI or USB and not support PCIe. Now there is one cool thing I forgot to mention. The power supplies for the 7010 and 5060 are 19 volt barrel jack power supplies, but the power supply for the 3040 is actually just a five volt power supply. So it's totally possible to solder your own cable to this and power this from any other USB power delivery device. Actually, Pollard's Adventures, I think I'm saying that right, I hope, did a video on the 3040 and did this exact thing, so go check that out. That's probably the first of many shoutouts to Apollo's Adventures because he has some great videos on these Dell Y systems. Cracking open the 5060 was a bit more interesting. There is also an M.2 E key slot that I was a bit more hopeful might support PCIe. It has two SODIMM slots for DDR3 memory and also a full size SATA port for the eight gigabyte flash module. Hardware wise, the 7010 was the most interesting. Rather than M.2 for the Wi-Fi card, it had a mini PCIe slot, which definitely supports PCIe. It also not only had the SATA port for the flash module, but it also had another SATA port that you could use for another drive. Although there's no power delivery unless you use this little four pin header, which good luck finding a cable for. I was also surprised to see that this has full size DDR3 dim sockets. Now on the 5060 and 7010, because they have the full size SATA ports, you can actually swap out the eight gig flash module with the two and a half inch SSD. I decided to do this, that way I could preserve the old SSDs and still have the thin OS and thin Linux, just in case I wanted to mess around with it. You can swap out the SSDs by using an extension like this one, but with some two and a half inch SSDs, you can actually just remove the PCB and slot it in directly. This at least worked on the 7010, which has a bit more room with a Lexar 128 gig SSD. For some rough benchmarks, I decided to install Debian 12 and then run Sysbench. This isn't a super deep dive benchmarking video by any means, but Sysbench should hopefully give an idea of how well these CPUs can perform and how much power they draw. Somewhat surprisingly, installing Debian on these systems was not the easiest thing. The 5060 was pretty straightforward, I just had to enable USB boot and disable secure boot, but the BIOS on the 7010 didn't have an option to disable secure boot, and so I ran into this issue when trying to install Debian using my Ventoy drive. When using a dedicated Debian 12 installer though, it worked just fine. The 3040 is a bit trickier because there's a UEFI bug that doesn't play very nice with Debian. Once again, huge shout out to Applauds Adventures because he has a video covering the 3040 and went into detail on how to make some changes to the Grub bootloader to fix this. So once again, go check out his videos, they're fantastic. After following his advice and using Debian rescue mode to fix the bootloader issue, I was able to get Debian installed on all three systems. I started off with the CPU benchmark running a single thread, and we can see that the 5060 takes a pretty massive lead with 1,131 events per second, followed by the 3040 with 424, and the 7010 with 165. When jumping up to four threads, the 5060 still has a pretty massive lead with 3965, and the 3040 jumps up a good bit to 1483, leaving the 7010 in the dust with a score of only 329. When looking at power draw, we see while sitting at idle, the 3040 takes a massive lead here sitting at just 2.5 watts, with the 5060 at 6.5 watts, and the 7010 at 8.4 watts. When running the four threaded CPU benchmark, the 5060 jumps all the way up to 18 watts, with the 7010 behind at 15.2, and the 3040 all the way down at 4.3. Now just looking at these numbers, you might think the 5060 has some really solid performance, with the 3040 drawing basically no power, and the 7010 just being a bit lackluster, but when we throw the Raspberry Pi 4 in the mix, we see that things look quite a bit different. Running the four threaded benchmark, the Raspberry Pi blows everything out of the water with a score of 7,134 events per second. While sitting at idle, it only draws 2.8 watts, and when running the CPU benchmark, draws 5.9 watts. So the Raspberry Pi has very similar power draw to the 3040, while having double the performance of the 5060. But benchmarks aren't everything, and these still may have something to offer in terms of real-world performance. 
Before trying anything out, I decided to upgrade both the 5060 and 7010 to 8GB of DDR3. I also tested out the M.2 and mini PCIe ports. Unfortunately, there was no luck on the 3040, as I expected, but with the 5060, I was able to get PCIe working. I was able to see this SATA adapter in LSPCI with no issues, and even ran a 2.5 gigabit NIC, although I got this weird non-VGA stuff. Not quite sure about that, but the NIC showed up, so hey, it works. Using an adapter, I also got those same two cards working on the 7010. Now the 7010 is a bit more interesting here, as it has that extra SATA port, and if we add two SATA ports via the mini PCIe, we now have four SATA ports, and so I kind of got this weird idea in my head of, could you use this as a wacky little NAS? To kind of test that out, I used a power splitter to get power from the main SATA port, and then plugged in two SSDs, one to the second SATA port, and then one to one of the SATA ports on the M.2 module. While the SSD on the M.2 module wasn't bootable, it was recognized in Linux, so yeah, you technically could have four drives hooked up to this and have a goofy little NAS if you wanted. While the 7010 had some decent expandability, I wasn't expecting much in terms of performance based off the benchmarks, so I decided to see if it could just run something like Casa OS and a few basic containers. I ran Home Assistant in a Docker container, and it worked pretty well. I was even able to set up my security cameras and view them without too many streaming issues. I also ran Jellyfin, and as long as you were just direct streaming H.264, it worked pretty well. However, as soon as you tried to run HEVC or anything else that might need to get transcoded, it just kind of died. With the 5060 having relatively more CPU horsepower, I decided to see what all it might be able to handle, and so I decided to try running a Minecraft server. And even though I used a paper server, which is a bit more lightweight, the experience still wasn't amazing. The server might be playable if you just had a few friends and you kind of stayed in the same area, but as soon as you tried running out into the distance, terrain generation became an issue. I imagine this would get even worse if you tried having multiple people all going in different directions. This was kind of a bummer because, yeah, the older AMD G-series chips aren't that powerful, but I was hoping by having a 4-core variant it might be able to do a little bit more heavy lifting. On the 3040, I decided to install the Home Assistant operating system to see if this could be an alternative to some of the dedicated Home Assistant boxes. Now theoretically, this should be possible, but I had a ton of issues. My plan was to try live booting into a Linux distro, and then downloading and flashing the Home Assistant OS image onto the embedded flash storage. However, every time I tried this, either the system would lock up or Belena Etcher would crash and fail, and I don't know if this was a memory limitation or what. Technically, I know it's possible because, once again, Apollard's Adventures did this on his 3040 video, so I'm not really sure what I was doing wrong, but after multiple attempts and errors, I eventually just gave up and decided to move on to something else. Now, I would never recommend any of these as desktop machines because they're really lightweight, and realistically, if you're just wanting something for a desktop, there are a lot of other systems out there that cost basically the same and will do a much better job. And even if they do draw more power, you're using it as a desktop, so you're not running it 24-7. So yeah, I just don't think these are a great option as desktop machines. That being said, while trying to install Belena Etcher and trying to flash Home Assistant onto the SSD, I got a decent amount of experience using the 3040 as a desktop machine, and it wasn't great. Using this as a desktop kind of gave me the inspiration to try out something more akin to what these were designed for. Once again, I don't have any experience with virtual desktop infrastructure and things like Citrix or whatever, but I decided to use Proxmox to run a Linux Mint virtual machine and then set up Spice. Then on this machine, I downloaded the configuration file and used Vert Viewer to remote into it, and that was actually a pretty good experience. Trying to do more demanding things like watching YouTube videos wasn't that great, but just browsing the internet and doing other desktop stuff was a much more smooth experience than trying to actually run a desktop on this itself, which I guess just goes to show that these do a decent job when they're doing what they're designed to do. In my short time working with these Dellwise systems, I've learned that they can be a lot of fun to play around with, but also sort of a big pain in the butt. But are they worth it? In my opinion, if you get a really good deal on one of these and you want to use it for tinkering or running some sort of project, or as a really lightweight server, yeah, it can actually be a pretty good deal. Even though they're not the most efficient thing in the world, they still draw such little power, it's probably not going to affect your power bill too much. And while they can be a pain, they can still be a lot of fun to tinker with. That being said, I was a bit surprised on the prices of some of these Dell Y systems, especially the older ones. 
I found some listings for the 3040 for around 20 bucks or so, and that's probably not that bad of a deal considering just how little power it draws. But for some of the older systems like the 7010, it's just really probably not worth it. All right, really quick future editing Colton here. It seems that I missed the current pricing of the 5060s, and in my opinion, it's actually a pretty good deal. The 5060 doesn't draw that much power at idle and has pretty good performance when you need it, and it's about the same price as the 7010. So actually a pretty good deal, but once again, really this always comes down to what price you can get and if that's worth it for the hardware. All right, back to the video. Even if you're taking into account the upgradability of the SSD and RAM, realistically, by the time you buy more RAM and an SSD and any adapters to use in the M.2 or mini PCIe slots, you're probably just better off buying a better system to begin with. But maybe I'm totally wrong, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on these Dell Y systems down in the comments. Speaking of that, if you have any ideas on what you think I can do with these, make sure to put them down in the comments below, and there's a good chance I might make a video on it. That's pretty much it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.